FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's November 28th, 2017. November's gone, but there's still December ahead of us, and there's always next year. Well, you've been watching China, been watching Trump's diplomacy in China, the relationship that has emerged between Trump and President Xi, and seeing where this relationship's going, what are China's ambitions? What are they after? What's their vision for the world? And, well, someone who's written a book about it, an interesting book uh, called Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to World Order. Hopefully, it's a threat to the new world order. We don't know if we like that or not. Well, as always, be part of the show. Email us at kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at kerrylutz. So, Stephen Mosier, written this book, and hey, I think we should start with uh, with Trump's trip to to Asia, what he accomplished, uh, if he accomplished anything. So first, I welcome you to the show. Well, thanks for having me on the show. So two things I noticed about Trump's trip to China. If you remember Obama's last trip, the Chinese refused, refused to wheel the stairway up to Air Force One, right. and he had to literally exit through the belly of Air Force One mm -hmm. on steps mm -hmm. that uh, every plane, you know, retractable stairwells. The mm -hmm. other thing, which I thought was, well, if you saw chi uh, China's welcome of Trump, uh, not only did they wheel the stairwell up to the up to the plane, but the red carpet went as far as the eye could see. Hundreds of Chinese officials there greeting him with flags and that was pretty major. One could say, well, they're just appealing to his narcissistic impulses. But the other thing which made me believe that that wasn't strictly the case was the reception that they had for Trump at the Forbidden City in a room that hadn't been used in a 100 years. To the Chinese, the Forbidden City is like the Vatican is to the Catholics or Jerusalem is to the Jews or Mecca to the Muslims. The fact that they had that affair in the Forbidden City was pretty telling, wasn't it? Well, it was. And you have to understand that the, uh, that the Chinese empire, uh, because that's what, that's what China is, it's an empire that survived into the present age, surrounded by nation states. Uh, the Chinese Empire has uh, is a past master at barbarian management, and everybody outside the magic circle of uh, the Chinese ethnicity and culture and history is a barbarian by definition. And so they're very good at, at managing these types of events, and nothing happens by accident. Everything is planned out to the T, according to an almost Confucian ritual. So when uh, President Obama landed in Hangzhou and was met with nothing, uh, that was not an accident. That was a deliberate slight uh, by China of a president that they saw as feckless, as a president they saw as almost irrelevant at that point. He made himself irrelevant, of course, by ignoring uh, China trade violations and theft of intellectual property for the most part for his entire term in office. Uh, leaving the next president, his successor, President Trump, with a major problem on his hands. Uh, Trump, on the other hand, was greeted uh, like a um, like a president of the United States uh, should be greeted. Uh, his his reception made us all proud. Um, Obama's reception was intended to humiliate the country he represented um, for good or for ill for eight years. So yeah, there's there's a lot in 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 that that we that we can unpack. It shows respect for not just the president of the United States, President Trump, it shows respect for the country and the people he represents. And I think they, 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 the Chinese um, appreciate um, strong leadership. They certainly have a, a, a strong leader. I call him the new red emperor in, in, uh, in Xi Jinping. Uh, he's known as President Xi, but he's much more than that. He's the generalissimo of the People's Liberation Army. He's the chairman of the military commission. He's the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party in the same way that Mao Zedong was, uh, the first red emperor. Uh, she is described as the core of the party. Nobody since Mao has ever been described as the core 
of the party leadership. And by that, they mean he's the center, he's the, he's the uh, paramount leader, he's the number one guy. And I thought, I thought actually that Trump was very clever in, in before leaving for China, calling uh, Xi Jinping, congratulating him on being elected, quote unquote, to another five year term. I think he'll be in office until he dies, actually. But he was very clever in calling Xi Jinping and saying that, uh, congratulating him on becoming uh, the king of China, because he's actually more than a king. He's, he's the new emperor of the new Chinese imperial red dynasty that we see unfolding before our eyes and that has a desire to recover China's lost place in the world. China's place in the world was always at its center. And she is very ambitious to put China back in the center of the Asian continent, uh, put back China back in the center of the world. So, um, but, but Trump did, I think, what he described doing many times in The Art of the Deal. When you're negotiating, the first thing you have to do is you have to make sure you understand who the principal is on the other side. Who's the guy who's making the decisions, who's calling the shots? You don't want to be negotiating with a number two or number three or number four guy who can then at the end of the negotiation say, well, I have to run this back to my boss. It's a waste of your time. She is the boss. Trump has identified him and Trump put pressure on him to do something about trade, do something about North Korea. And uh, I think that's all to the good. So he put pressure on him. Did he accomplish anything? Well, I think the jury's still out on that. I mean, the Chinese are excel at shadow play, uh, not just barbarian management, but putting on a good show. So when they close the main bridge, as they did a few days ago, leading from China across the Yalu River at Dandong into North Korea, halting the, the cross-border traffic there, uh, they claimed it was just for bridge maintenance, <laughs> but it was certainly sending a, sig a signal to uh, Kim Jong-il. And yet Kim just now fired off another ballistic missile. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see what China does. China could shut down North Korea tomorrow. It would have to do two things. It would close the border with North Korea. Uh, that would cut off 90% of North Korea's trade. The second thing it would do is it would end its mutual defense treaty with North Korea. And, and yes, people heard me correctly. China has of a mutual defense treaty with North Korea, pledging to defend North Korea in the event it is attacked. That's the only treaty China has with any other country. And if they were serious about reigning in North Korea, they could, they could and they should cancel that treaty. Agreed. So it is interesting yeah, that they've, uh, they've taken a number of steps, no more uh, direct flights to North Korea. Right. They've done that. And they, and they said we had no more direct flights because there's no passenger traffic. Well, <laughs> that's another excuse. Right. Close the bridge for bridge maintenance. Uh, stop the airline flights because there's no passenger traffic. So there's it's you never get a straight answer from from the Chinese leadership on this. They're playing again. They're continuing to play both sides against the United States. So the question is, though, what's in their interest now? Keep keep uh, challenging the U.S. or um, work with the U.S.? What is in their long-term interest here? Because that's all they care about, right? It, it is. Uh, they have a 100-year plan uh, that, that the clock began ticking in, in 1949. And by, by 2049, uh, a couple of decades from now, they intend to be the, the, the dominant power on the planet. Um, in fact, I think it's coming sooner than that. I think we're reaching a tipping point in five or 10 years, after which it will be uh, difficult for us to recover. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Dunford, uh, just testified before Congress that the uh, that the looming threat uh, is is China. Uh, China, uh, Russia, and Islamic terrorism will fall by the wayside, he said. But by 2025, the primary threat faced by the United States will come from the People's Republic of China. So they do have a long-term view of things. Uh, we have a short-term view. I mean, we're governed by the election cycle. Uh, as I say, Xi, uh, General Xi, uh, President Xi, whatever you want to call him, Emperor Xi, uh, will be in power. Uh, he's a relatively young man in his mid-60s. He'll be in power for the next 25 years. So he can afford to take the long view. Um, we control our own destiny at this point. In 10 or 15 years, we won't. Uh, the cards will be in China's hands. And um, uh, they will be able to do what they want, regardless of what opinions we have about it. So it's important that, that we have we get our act together, that we pass tax cuts, that we have economic growth, sustained economic growth for the next 10 years, because that and probably only that will really set back China's plans by a generation. Well, now, when you look at China, though, 
Uh, they've been in the position of uh, world dominance before or close to it. And they, as Henry Kissinger said, they managed to screw that up. Um, are they going to screw it up again? Um, you know, they've got credit debt problems there that kind of make the U.S. look uh, look minute by comparison. They have been buying a lot of gold and silver, but uh, it's questionable in the current economic environment what that really means. So what's going to happen here? Uh, are they really uh, as strong as they look? Or are they faking it? What's happening? Well, I, th there's always there's always the uh, the Potemkin village aspect to any uh, foreigner who's coming to China and looking around because they 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 put the best face is very important and they put put the best face on everything. A lot of the new high rise buildings, uh, office buildings, condominiums in China are still empty because China is terribly overbuilt. It's easy for well connected officials who who run construction companies to get. Uh, soft loans from Chinese state, provincial, and local banks. Uh, pocket some of the money and then build a build, say, a condominium uh, complex that that nobody wants to live in or can afford to buy. So there is a lot of that. There is a lot of charade. There is a lot of Potemkin Village stuff going on. Uh, on the other hand, you've got 1.3 billion of the most enterprising, industrious, hardworking people on the planet, um, and and they're simply trying to improve their lives. And you know, if the Chinese Communist Party uh, a corrupt enterprise, if there ever was one, would simply get out of the way. Uh, China could actually grow economically a lot faster than it is growing now. But 25% of everything in China goes uh, to pay off officials, goes into their pockets. There are tremendous disparities of wealth in China, not governed by you know economic prowess. I mean, I, I don't fault the capitalist for doing well in his in his entrepreneurship. But what I do find fault with are Chinese communist officials who do nothing to contribute to economic growth, uh, but yet pocket 25 percent of the protein uh, of the GDP each year, uh, generally into uh, foreign bank accounts so they can get their money overseas. There's a huge pool of money in China, uh, which is desperate to escape from that country because uh, it is your property is not safe in China from confiscation, whether it be land or or real estate or stocks, uh, the government can always intervene um, if, it, if it wants to and, and, and take that from you, as it has done in, in, in case after case over the years. Um, so there are, reason, uh, there are reasons to think that China is vulnerable. Um, they have a huge amount of debt, uh, a lot of which is not on the books. Now, now, it's a joke in China, but of course, all jokes mask an underlying reality, right? It's a joke in China that, that uh, a, a businessman will keep three sets of books. The first set will be kept for his foreign partners to show that he's losing money. Yeah. The second set will be shown to his domestic partner to show that he's only making a little money and therefore has very little to share with his partner. And <laughs> the final set will be his alone, and it will reveal the huge profits that he's actually making. So there's a lot of that going, uh, you know, financial subterfuge going on in China. Um, but yeah, the debt bubble. Uh, if it collapses, uh, we'll bring down we'll bring down uh, the Chinese economy a notch or two for certain. Isn't it? Um, the other vulnerability besides corruption, of course, is is the fact that China has had a one-child policy in place now for right. 36 years. 400 Disaster. million uh, Chinese have been eliminated by the one-child policy. Um, some people would say that's a good thing. I think if eliminating Democrat, 400 million of the most productive, enterprising people in the world is a bad a, idea. If you're a Democrat, you definitely think it's a good thing, right? Uh, hey, control the population at all costs. But it's been disastrous because you've got all these men with no women and you, what are they going to yeah. do right you also so. have you also have uh, that's destabilizing you know you got 25 million young men who will not be able to find brides what do they do well they don't get married and form families because they're the women they would have married were killed years ago uh so yeah do they engage in crime yes do they join gangs yes uh there, there are a lot of social problems as a result the aging of the population and this the, the, there is now a labor shortage which began last year in china uh, there are four million workers short in china the number will grow this year how do you create a labor shortage in in the world's most populous country well you eliminate 400 million 
of the next two generations. Uh, that's how you do it. And I think the Chinese uh, have ultimately made themselves poorer, uh, not richer, by this this massive uh, government intervention into the right of parents to decide for themselves the number and spacing of their children. If you look at India's prospects, India has a younger, more dynamic population, and, and e- economists project that India's future growth will outpace that of China because it has a younger, more dynamic workforce to work with. China doesn't. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. They're kind of like in the uh, same boat uh, Japan is in, right? Well, Japan is a lot further down that road. Uh, Japan's population has been shrinking uh, since uh, uh, 2000. And, and uh, that, that shrinkage, that is to say, Japan is filling more coffins than cradles each year. It's digging more graves than, than having births. Uh, they're selling more adult diapers in Japan these days than they are baby diapers. Oh, God, yeah. Now, that's not a good thing. Uh, for a country. Uh, It's cutting into Japan's economic growth already, and uh, it's forcing Japan to to Japanese to downsize their expectations for future economic growth. So, um, yeah, Japan is a lot further down that road than China is, but China is close on its heel. The Chinese population, because of the one-child policy, is aging more rapidly than, than I think any human population has ever aged. And um, and that will have dire consequences for economic growth down down the road. Yeah, a little bit uh, scary there. But yet, uh, you know, they've managed. Uh, well, when you look at all the problems in the world, and there are many, uh, how important is uh, not having a, a self-replenishing, if you will, population? How important is that? Well, I th- I think over the long run, it's the only thing that matters. I mean, a country that that doesn't uh, have enough children to maintain the current population, a country like Italy where the population is shrinking from year to year, ultimately has to decide who it wants to give its country to because obviously the the Italians, the Japanese, uh, don't want their country enough to populate it themselves. So eventually other peoples will move in. There are lots of Filipino immigrants now in Japan, a country that historically has not been very welcoming of immigrants. There are a lot of um, people from Albania and other uh, and Middle Eastern countries in Italy now because the birth rate is about 1.3 children per couple, uh, which is a recipe for economic uh, demographic economic disaster over time. So ultimately, it matters a great deal. Now, over the short term, of course, uh, we have the Chinese economy still growing at five or six percent, um, and we have um, a huge uh, number of surplus males who would uh, make it very easy for China to recruit a, a large army, uh, which it continues to do. So uh, over the short term, it's not that much of a handicap. Over the long term, it would prove much more so. And yeah, so China's relationship with Russia, uh, probably many of you aren't aware, but China is effectively colonizing, um, colonizing Siberia. Because they're always looking for more resources. China is becoming a bit of a desert over time. And so the colonization, which Russia seems uh, helpless to do anything about. Well, I, I, write in, I write in Bully of Asia about the fact that uh, one of the consequences of having these 25, 30 million single young men is that they've gone overseas in large number. And they, they, there are probably now more Chinese in living in Vladivostok than there are Russians. Uh, there may be more Chinese. The Russian population of Siberia is decreasing from year to year as the Russians who were forcibly sent there by Stalin under the Soviet Union are moving back to, to warmer climes. Uh, I don't consider Moscow to be particularly warm, but it's a lot better than, you know, 50 yes. degrees below zero week after week in Siberia. And the Chinese, are the single Chinese are moving in. They're moving into the Central Asian countries. They're moving into uh, Burma, um, um, Thailand, other countries along China's perimeter. Um, uh, seeking brides in part, seeking economic opportunities in part. But I don't think that, um, I, you know, I, I, I wrote in, in Bully of Asia that, that uh, China uh, wants raw materials from Russia. But Russia, on the other hand, does not want to become uh, China's Canada. They don't want to become a second rate power. And I think that, that Russia essentially put China on notice about 15 years ago. Uh, when it said that any aggression against Russia uh, would be met not with a conventional response, but with a nuclear response. Um, 
Obviously, they can't match China in manpower, but they still have a very potent nuclear arsenal. Now, they put China on notice that any territorial claims against Russia and, and uh, the China, in the Chinese view, look, in the Chinese view, the Russian Far East was stolen from the Manchu Empire uh, about 100 years ago, uh, 150 years ago. Uh, in the Chinese view, much of Central Asia should belong to China that now is in the, uh, the stands. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan. Right. So there are unresolved territorial claims. China has unresolved territorial claims at all points of the compass, to the east, to the south, the South China Sea, uh, towards India, and, and, of course, towards the Russian Far East. Yeah, interesting. And, you know, it's these things we don't think about. We just assume that uh, that their interests are congruent, but in many respects, not the case. Well, uh, no country, I think, that shares a border with China is completely comfortable with that fact. Um, because, because uh, remember, uh, from 1949 on, uh, with the establishment of the People's Republic of China, uh, over time, China has um, launched attacks on the, the offshore islands of Formosa, Taiwan. Uh, it has invaded Vietnam. It, uh, it of course, uh, it, it fought against us in the Korean War. It has had conflicts with, with the Soviet Union on the border of the, um, the, uh, the river between Manchuria and uh, the Russian Far East. It has had clashes uh, with the Indian. Well, they're, they're, they're recently there were very, very uh, uh, dangerous clashes in the tiny protectorate of Bhutan, where the Chinese were moving in and building roads and territory that historically belonged to Bhutan, and the, the Indians sent troops in. So, uh, you know, China has a history of aggression against its near neighbors. So um, if you shared uh, a, a long land border with China, as Russia does, uh, you would be um, on your toes as well. Yeah, definitely. Keep your friends closer and your enemies even closer, right? And... Yeah. So the U.S., what uh, are we on the right path to do this now under Trump to contain them or confront them or is it over? Well, I, I think, you know, we're, we're five or 10 years away from a tipping point. I think we can we can postpone uh, the day when China, uh, you know, uh, then when these matters are out of our own hands, when we no longer control our own destiny. Uh, right now, uh, China's economy is still vulnerable. A shock. It has this huge debt bubble. It has the problem, uh, the problem of the aging population. I think we need to. Um, I think we're on the right track. I think we simply need to do and trade what Japan does. Whenever China exports more to Japan than it buys from Japan, the Japanese Minister of Trade gets on the plane, goes to Beijing, and says, "We have to straighten this out. You have to buy more Japanese goods, otherwise we will have difficulties in our trade relationship." And Magically, the trade gets back in balance. We've let things go uh, far too long in China's direction. We've let them use non-tariff barriers to keep our goods out of their country. They've closed off entire sectors of their economy, the insurance sector, for example, uh, to American businesses. Uh, while we've opened our markets uh, to let them flood uh, our country, fill our big box stores with Chinese-made goods, um, the World Trade Organization, uh, which Trump criticized uh, when he was in Asia, uh, for not enforcing the rules. You know, he didn't mention China in that speech down, down in Southeast Asia. But that comment was directed towards China because China no sooner joined the World Trade Organization in 2000, no sooner was the ink dry on the document than they began violating the rules that they had agreed to abide by. Uh, they refused to open their markets. So they refused to, to let their currency uh, float. Um, and they've been doing it ever since, and we've, we've not gotten, they've kept out Hollywood movies. They have a quota for the number of Hollywood movies that uh, can be shown in China each year. So in area after area, in sector after sector, they've kept their economy closed while, while they've ransacked ours um, with thefts of intellectual property, uh, with, uh, with the ongoing cyber war, with the ongoing... Uh, um, attacks in in uh, in cyberspace against private companies, um, stealing proprietary data, and and so forth. We've let that go on far far too long. Uh, what we've seen over the last 20 years, I think, especially since the China joined the World Trade Organization, is the largest transfer of wealth in human history from the United States to China. Um, 
and and that transfer of wealth has taken many many forms. Uh, currency manipulation is one. This unfair trade relationship is another. The theft of intellectual property is another. Um, the idea that the 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 recurrent uh, situation where you have American companies uh, invited to go into China, allowed to o- operate in China only if they bring in their cutting edge, edge technology, only to have that technology stolen, their capital drained, and then to find themselves squeezed out of China by unfair competition from local competitors who have stolen their technology yep. and are using it to produce goods at a cheaper rate. So uh, that's the trillions of dollars uh, have been stolen from us. So is Trump the one to put an end to it? Well, I hope so. Uh, obviously, he's not a politician. <laughs> he's not. Yeah. He doesn't. He doesn't act and or talk like a politician, which offends a lot of people. But um, but he is a businessman, and and he's interested in the bottom line. And I think the fact that he brought back three hundred million, three hundred billion, I should say, um, orders for American goods and services back from a twelve-day trip in uh, in Asia, it was a pretty good haul. For less than two weeks of work. Um, part of that, of course, uh, most of that uh, are orders from China. Um, some of it are orders from Korea, with which we run a trade deficit, orders from Japan, with which we run a trade deficit. Mm-hmm. But um, I think people in Asia uh, re- treated him with respect because uh, they know that he's watching the bottom line. They know that he's uh, standing up for American workers and wants to bring jobs and and factories back to the United States. You know, you cannot be a a major economic power unless you actually make things. Well, it's fine to talk about Silicon Valley and and, and, uh, and all of the the Internet and so forth, but um, there's only so much you can do in cyberspace. In real space, you have to make things. You have to make steel. You have to make you have to mine coal. You have to make cars. You have to make ships and planes. And if you don't have a manufacturing base, of course, uh, you'll find it very difficult to defend yourself in the event of a conflict. Mm. Yep, agreed. There, it's kind of it seems inevitable. Anyway, uh, Steve, uh, just tell us uh, where we get your book and uh, your website, please. Well, the book is called Bully of Asia because I see China as a bully. And the way to deal with a bully, of course, is to stand up to the bully and then Kick he the will in his eyes. <laughs> slink away. And, and yeah. um, you can get the book at pop.org, P-O-P dot O-R-G, uh, or you can simply go on Amazon. If you get it from uh, my shop, I'll be happy to sign the copy before I send it out. Oh, well, there's a good reason to go to pop.org, and we'll have a link to the, your site in the show notes to this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Just go there, sign up for a newsletter, and look, uh, we love you for to be involved in the show. Uh, Stephen has made a lot of interesting points that I know will resonate with a lot of you out there. Email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. You could Twitter us at at Kerry Lutz. The Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Steve, been a pleasure. Very enlightening and very thought-provoking. Good luck on the book, and we will talk to you again soon. I look forward to it. Thank you. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. As far as the eye could see, hundreds of Chinese officials there greeting him with flags and that was pretty major. One could say, well, they're just appealing to his narcissistic impulses. But the other thing which made me believe that that wasn't strictly the case was the reception that they had for Trump at the Forbidden City in a room that hadn't been used in a 100 years. To the Chinese, the Forbidden City is like the Vatican is to the Catholics or Jerusalem is to the Jews or Mecca to the Muslims. The fact that they had that affair in the Forbidden City was pretty telling, wasn't it? Well, it was. And you have to understand that the uh, that the Chinese empire, uh, because that's what, that's what China is, it's an empire that survived into the present age, surrounded by nation states. Uh, the Chinese empire has uh, is a past master at barbarian management. And everybody outside the magic circle of uh, the Chinese ethnicity and culture and history is a barbarian by definition. And so they're very good at, at managing these types of events. And nothing happens by accident. Everything is planned out to the T, according to an almost Confucian ritual. So when uh, President Obama landed in Hangzhou and was met with nothing, uh, that was 
not an accident. That was a deliberate slight by China of a president that they saw as feckless, as a president they saw as almost irrelevant at that point. He made himself irrelevant, of course, by ignoring uh, China trade violations and theft of intellectual property for the most part for his entire term in office. Uh, leaving the next president, his successor, President Trump, with a major problem on his hands. Uh, Trump, on the other hand, was greeted uh, like a um, like a president of the United States uh, should be greeted. Uh, his his reception made us all proud. Um, Obama's reception was intended to humiliate the country he represented um, for good or for ill for eight years. So yeah, there's there's a lot in 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 that that we that we can unpack. It's that's all to the good. So he put pressure on him. Did he accomplish anything? Well, I think the jury's still out on that. I mean, the Chinese are excel at shadow play, uh, not just barbarian management, but putting on a good show. So when they close the main bridge, as they did a few days ago, leading from China across the Yalu River at Dandong into North Korea, halting the, the cross-border traffic there, uh, they claimed it was just for bridge maintenance. <laughs> but it was certainly sending a, sig a signal to uh, Kim Jong-il. And yet Kim just now fired off another ballistic missile. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see what China does. China could shut down North Korea tomorrow. It would have to do two things. It would close the border with North Korea. Uh, that would cut off 90% of North Korea's trade. The second thing it would do is it would end its mutual defense treaty with North Korea. And, and yes, people heard me correctly. China has of a mutual defense treaty with North Korea, pledging to defend North Korea in the event it is attacked. That's the only treaty China has with any other country. And if they were serious about reigning in North Korea, they could, they could and they should cancel that treaty. Agreed. So it is interesting yeah, that they've, uh, they've taken a number of steps, no more uh, direct flights to North Korea. Right. They've done that. And they, and they said we had no more direct flights because there's no passenger traffic. Well, <laughs> that's another excuse, right? Close the bridge for bridge maintenance. Uh, stop the airline flights because there's no passenger traffic. So there's, it's, you never get a straight answer from, from the Chinese leadership on this. They're playing, again, they're continuing to play both sides against the United States. So the question is, though, what's in their interest now? Keep keep uh, challenging the U.S. or um, work with the U.S.? What is in their long-term interest here? Because that's all they care about, right? It, it is. Uh, they have a 100-year plan uh, that, that the clock began ticking in, in 1949 and by, by 20... FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's November 28th, 2017. November's gone, but... There's still December ahead of us, and there's always next year. Well, you've been watching China, been watching Trump's diplomacy in China, the relationship that has emerged between Trump and President Xi, and seeing where this relationship's going, what are China's ambitions? What are they after? What's their vision for the world? And, well, someone who's written a book about it, uh, Interesting book uh, called Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to World Order. Hopefully it's a threat to the new world order. We don't know if we like that or not. Well, as always, be part of the show. Email us at kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz. So Stephen Mosier, written this book, and hey, I think we should start with, uh, with Trump's trip to, to Asia, what he accomplished, uh, if he accomplished anything. So first, I welcome you to the show. Well, thanks for having me on the show. So two things I noticed about Trump's trip to China. If you remember Obama's last trip, the Chinese refused, refused to wheel the stairway up to Air Force <laughs> One, right. and he had to literally exit through the belly of Air Force One mm -hmm. on steps mm -hmm. that uh, every plane, you know, retractable stairwells. The mm -hmm. other thing, which I thought was, well, 
if you saw China, uh, China's welcome of Trump, uh, not only did they wheel the stairwell up to the tr- up to the plane, but the red carpet went 49. Uh, a couple of decades from now, they intend to be the 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 dominant power on the planet. Um, in fact, I think it's coming sooner than that. I think we're reaching a tipping point in five or ten years, after which it will be uh, difficult for us to recover. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Dunford, uh, just testified before Congress that the uh, that the looming threat uh, is is China. Uh, China, uh, Russia, and Islamic terrorism will fall by the wayside, he said. But by 2025, the primary threat faced by the United States will come from the People's Republic of China. So they do have a long-term view of things. Uh, We have a short-term view. I mean, we're governed by the election cycle. Uh, As I say, Xi, uh, General Xi, uh, President Xi, whatever you want to call him, Emperor Xi, uh, will be in power. Uh, He's a relatively young man in his mid-60s. He'll be in power for the next 25 years. So he can afford to take the long view. Um, we control our own destiny at this point. In 10 or 15 years, we won't. Uh, the cards will be in China's hands, and um, uh, they will be able to do what they want, regardless of what opinions we have about it. So it's important that, that we have we get our act together, that we pass tax cuts, that we have economic growth, sustained economic growth for the next 10 years, because that, and probably only that, will really set back China's plans by a generation. Well, now, when you look at China, though, uh, they've been in the position of uh, world dominance before or close to it. And they, as Henry Kissinger said, they managed to screw that up. Um, Are they going to screw it up again? Um, You know, they've got credit debt problems there that kind of make the U.S. look uh, look minute by comparison. They have been buying a lot of gold and silver, but uh, it's questionable in the current economic environment what that really means. So what's going to happen here? Uh, are they really uh, as strong as they look? Or are they faking it? What's happening? Well, I, th- there's always there's always the... Uh... Uh, the Potemkin village aspect to any shows respect for not just the president of the United States, President Trump, it shows respect for the country and the people he represents. And I think they, they, the, the Chinese um, appreciate um, strong leadership. They certainly have a, a, a strong leader. I call him the new red emperor in, in, uh, in Xi Jinping. Uh, he's known as President Xi, but he's much more than that. He's the generalissimo of the People's Liberation Army. He's the chairman of the military commission. He's the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. In the same way that Mao Zedong was uh, the first Red Emperor, uh, Xi is described as the core of the party. Nobody since Mao has ever been described as the core of the party leadership. And by that, they mean he's the center. He's the he's the uh, paramount leader. He's the number one guy. And I thought, I thought actually that Trump was very clever in, in before leaving for China, calling uh, Xi Jinping, congratulating him on being elected, quote unquote, to another five year term. I think he'll be in office until he dies, actually. But he was very clever in calling Xi Jinping and saying that, uh, congratulating him on becoming uh, the king of China, because he's actually more than a king. He's, he's the new emperor of the new Chinese imperial red dynasty that we see unfolding before our eyes and that has a desire to recover China's lost place in the world. China's place in the world was always at its center. And she is very ambitious to put China back in the center of the Asian continent, uh, put back China back in the center of the world. So, um, but, but Trump did, I think what he described doing many times in the art of the deal. When you're negotiating, the first thing you have to do is you have to make sure you understand who the principal is on the other side. Who's the guy who's making the decisions, who's calling the shots? You don't want to be negotiating with a number two or number three or number four guy who can then at the end of the negotiation say, well, I have to run this back to my boss. It's a waste of your time. She is the boss. Trump has identified him and Trump put pressure on him to do something about trade, do something about North Korea. And uh, I 